Hey there, how's everybody doing? Okay, so here's the premise of today's video. You are considering getting into rangefinder 35 millimeter photography, but you don't have a money tree growing in your backyard. Therefore, Leica collecting is out of the question. What are your options? Well, one possible option would be the, um, the mount which preceded the Leica M mount, the uh, Leica thread mount also called M39. And in the M39 mount, there are basically um, two major systems other than Leica itself, other than the, the high dollar um, stuff produced in Germany. You've got the Japanese rangefinders and the Soviet rangefinders, which were based upon and modeled after um, the pre-war Leica system. Um, and were, were development were, were developed well based upon you know, the the the, um, the, well, the pre-war Leicas and developed from there. So there is some interoperability between these two systems. It's not complete, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, what I have here are two representatives, and these are the two most popular um, uh, representatives of each of those systems. Over here, we've got the Canon P. Uh, this is without question the most popular uh, Japanese rangefinder in M39 mount. Uh, there were approximately 100,000 of these cameras produced. I think a little bit, just just shy or just slightly under 100,000 units of this camera were produced um, from what was it from 1959 to I'm not sure exactly when they ceased production, but I believe this camera was introduced um, in at some point in the late 50s. I think 59. Um, and here we have the Zorky 4, uh, and this was also introduced in the uh, mid-50s, 56 maybe, 57, let's see, 55, 56, mid-50s, um, and continued into production into the 1970s, uh, and there were approximately 1.7 million versions or, or units of this camera produced. Um, and if you add to that the half million um, copies of the Zorky 4K, uh, the 4K followed the Zorky 4 and it simply added a, um, a, a K for, for crank, a, a, an advanced lever. It added an advanced lever here instead of the, um, uh, as opposed to the knob rewind, or the knob wind rather, uh, which, uh, which the, Zor the 4K, excuse me, which the Zorky 4 featured. Um, if you add those two together, you're talking about, what's that, 2.3, 2.2 million units, something like that. So there's at least an order of magnitude which separates uh, the production figures of the Soviet um, champion versus the Japanese champion over there. Um, although you can still find both of these in, on the second and collector market, they are available, they can be found. So let's talk about where to find them first and, and where do you find them and what are they, you know, they going to cost you. So um, I'm going to give a couple of recommendations, and again, these are just my thoughts and my recommendations. They, they, they don't, don't take it for gospel, take it for what it's worth. Um, but in the world of Soviet cameras, you need to be rather particular about your source. You need to be careful from whom you buy, because the, uh, the quality control at Soviet, Soviet factories was notoriously non-existent. Um, and so you, you need to buy from a source uh, that gives you confidence that the thing you're buying is going to work uh, as it should. So one possibility is a gentleman by the name of Oleg. I've never dealt with him personally. I have not, I have not personally bought from Oleg. Uh, but his reputation amongst the Soviet rangefinder and Soviet camera community is impeccable. Um, and his website is okvintagecamera.com. He is located in Russia. And uh, a, a quick review of his, of his website today indicated that he charges between 65 to 90 euro um, for, a, uh, for a Zorky 4, including a CLA. He advertises that all of his cameras are CLA before, before being shipped out. Um, and the price variation from 65 to 90 euro depends upon whether, he's, uh, whether you're getting an earlier model or a later model. The earlier models are more expensive because the, um, uh, the markings are engraved and Oleg seems to think there's a lot of value in that, like the, uh, the name here is engraved and the shutter speeds are engraved and I guess I might, I'm not sure, well, they're, the markings are engraved. These mar this is a later version, this version was from 1969, this one that I have in my hands here, and these markings are not engraved, they are, I don't know, silk screened or printed or 
Um, I, I think with, with heavy use, they can, they can rub off and wear off or fade, whereas the engraved ones, you know, obviously are, are more, uh, more permanent. Um, and there may be, I don't know, perhaps, perhaps the earlier ones were, were just made better, I'm not sure. Uh, but it appears to me that um, for, for 90 euro, you get an earlier model, which may have been made a little bit better and had the engraved uh, markings. And for 65 euro, you get the, um, you get the later model, which, had, um, which, which did not. Um, he ships by Russian Post, an institution renowned worldwide for its uh, reliability and uh, efficiency. Uh, although insured shipping is available. So I assume that's at an extra cost. I don't know. I didn't read the fine print. Uh, check his website for details. Uh, but that's, that's what I found at, um, um, at, at uh, Oleg's website. And that is one option to get a, a, a camera that you know is going to function and work. Uh, the other one that I know of, uh, there may be, again, there may be others, but these are just the two that I know is Yuri. Uh, I forgot Yuri's last name, but he is in New York and his uh, website is fedka.com, F-E-D-K-A.com. And I have purchased from Yuri's website several times. Um, in fact, most of, the, most of the Soviet equipment I own, I, I bought from him. Um, and I can wholeheartedly recommend uh, Yuri's website, fedka.com. Absolutely reliable. Everything that I've ever purchased from him uh, r arrived precisely as advertised. Um, and on his website today, he was advertising a Zorky 4 body um, from 1968 in excellent condition for $115 US. Um, I can't remember what sort of shipping services he uses, but I never had a problem when I bought from him. Although I was living in the United States at the time, I, I do not know what his international shipping policies are. So you'll have to check his website for that. Um, so how about for the Canon? Where are you going to get a Canon? Well, uh, today, I checked the websites of KEH in Atlanta, used Photo Pro in Indianapolis, and Camera Store in Finland, and couldn't find a single one. Um, then I went to eBay and found like a couple dozen uh, listings from Japanese sellers. So it seems that's the place to go to get a Canon P, would be the Japanese sellers on eBay. And I found um, the the typical uh, average going price for a Japanese seller Canon P listed in excellent or mint condition uh, was approximately uh, 250 US dollars or thereabouts roughly. Um, a few years ago the collector community was just uh, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over Japanese eBay sellers apparently they were you know they, they just had a, an absolutely stellar reputation. Um, I'm not sure if that's still the case. Uh, I'm, I've heard some rumblings that in recent years they're not quite as reliable as they used to be as a group. Um, I, I just I don't know. I'm, I'm probably one of the few active collectors who has never actually purchased from a Japanese eBay seller. Uh, although that is that is a very popular source for uh, the, the type of stuff that I talk about on my channel, um, and it seems to be a fairly reliable source for Canon P's. Um, are these sellers reliable? I really don't know. I have no experience and I can't tell you. Um, I, again, I've heard scuttlebutt in the community that the word mint tends to be uh, uh, grossly overused on, uh, on uh, Japanese eBay listings. Again, I, I don't know. I just have no experience with it. Um, my, the only advice I can give is, is read the dis uh, item description carefully and be very careful with seller feedback ratings and, um, and feedback comments, uh, I, I guess. If, if you've had experience, drop a note, drop a note in the comments, because um, I just, um, I, I don't know where else to get a, a good Canon P. If you know someplace, if you know a good, a good source for, for any of this stuff, for either a Canon P or Soviet range finders that I've not mentioned, please do leave a comment. Um, I'm sure that would be helpful to, uh, to folks. Um, okay, so if we compare these two cameras, what's, um, and uh, some people might argue that they're not even really comparable. I mean, they're, they're, they're very different cameras with very different personalities. Um, this one, I mean, the, the Zorky has knob advance. Uh, the uh, Canon features a lever advance, which is much more common, much more comfortable for most people. Um, although, frankly, people who complain about the knob advance being sticky, um, well, your camera probably just needs a CLA, frankly. Um, that's, that's my guess. Um, and, um, shoot, don't on it. Hold on a second. Which way is this going? Here we go. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this, the, the knob advance on this particular model 
turns just you know, without without any difficulty whatsoever. Um, you know, is it more convenient, more or less convenient than the than the lever advance? I've never had a problem with the lever, with the knob advance. I don't, I don't I don't think that's an issue. So let's look at some of the um, some of the features of the cameras. Cloth versus metal shutter curtain. The Canon features a metal shutter curtain. It also features a really neat way of opening the back. Let's take a look at that. That's a neat. That you turn this key here, which retracts this little lip, this metal lip right there, which then allows you to open the back with this um, by pulling out this right here. I like that. I like the safety feature. Um, the um, there, there are a number of cameras which uh, which feature backs that open with a uh, with a clasp like this, uh, but very few have this this additional safety feature, with, which I think is a good idea personally. Um, you can see here the metal shutter curtain. You can also see that the metal shutter curtain on this Canon P is wrinkled. I've done a separate video on wrinkled shutter curtains. Um, I'll just say that it is almost impossible to find a Canon rangefinder uh, which features a metal shutter curtain that is not wrinkled at all. That's extremely rare and a little bit of wrinkling on these shutter curtains generally is not a problem. The, what you see here um, is not a problem with this camera. I use this camera all the time. It's, it, it worked beautifully um, despite, these, uh, despite those wrinkles that you see. Um, and the, uh, the back of the Canon P, as you can see, it, it opens um, uh, you know, it's, it's SLR style basically. If you're accustomed to using SLRs from the 1970s, 1960s, and 1970s, um, then it, it opens up just like one of those, uh, which I find very convenient. I think that's a big plus. The um, uh, the Zorky, on the other hand, it's uh, well, it opens up contacts style. So you have to turn these two keys like so, and you pull the back off, and you got to be careful because. Yeah, film school spool is going to fall out. Um, you have to be really careful when you open up the Zorky because if, if this, you know, falls down the, uh, uh, the storm drain grate, uh, you're screwed. You are totally screwed. Without this, the camera is useless. So uh, you have to be real careful about opening up the back of this camera in the field. Um, because it, there's, with, with, at least with, with this one, this is a plastic take-up spool. I think some of the earlier models had a metal take-up spool, which, which, may have, which, had, uh, which may have had enough sort of natural tension not to fall off. Um, but this one, it's just, it's, it's just gonna fall off. Um, and it, and the, the, the Zorky features a common, ordinary cloth um, shutter curtain, which was, again, standard for the period. No, nothing, nothing wrong with it, it's just, um, um, I personally am a fan of metal shutter curtains, but that's just my prejudice. There are, there's no, you know, cloth shutter curtains were the were standard throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, well into the 1980s. Um, okay. Next uh, method of film loading. So yeah, so I sort of just um, um, I kind of just went over that basically because when you load film into the uh, the Canon, it, it loads like an SLR from the 1970s. It's really it was really ahead of its time. You've got the take up spool here where you, you fit the leader. Um, and um, I've done uh, separate videos on each of these cameras for, uh, for uh, um, in my, uh, my loading film series. I've got a playlist on the YouTube channel simply called Loading Film where I just show you how to load film into a, a variety of cameras. I think I've got 11 or 12 of them up there now. So um, this one loads just like an SLR from the 1970s, and it's, uh, which I think is great. It's really convenient. Um, the Zorky a little more fidgety, but not that hard, not that difficult. Again, take a look at the video I did on loading the film into, into the Zorky. It just, it's, it's, not, yeah, it's not that much more effort, frankly. Once you get used to it, it's no big deal. Um, auto parallax corrected frame lines versus turret accessory viewfinder. So the Canon P, when you look through the, the um, I don't know, can you see, can you see any of that? Can you, can you see that on the video? I don't know. There you go. Can you, does, that, does that show now? So anyway, the, um, the P has uh, very nice silvered frame lines in the viewfinder, which is a, a big, bright, clear viewfinder. It's, a fan for, for, it's a, uh, just a beautiful viewfinder. Um, and it's got frame lines for 35, 50, and 100 millimeters 
which are automatically parallax corrected, uh, which is just a great, wonderful feature. That the, this is it's just a, a great viewfinder in this thing. The Zorky, on the other hand, features no frame lines of any kind at all. It's just a a, a metal frame square with a with a rangefinder patch in the middle. Um, so if you're using a, a, a focal length lens other than the standard 50 millimeter, you've got to get you one of these. You've got to get an accessory viewfinder and for Soviet um, cameras. The most popular, the best option, in my opinion, is the, um, the KMZ turret viewfinder. I've done a separate viewfinder. I've, I have done a separate video on the use of this uh, viewfinder right here. It actually works quite well. Um, but in terms of parallax correction, you know, you're, uh, it's kind of, well, you, you do it manually. And for example, here's it, uh, here's the markings for 85 centimeters. You, uh, you basically focus your lens, look down at the lens and see how far away your subject is. And then you just, you, I mean, it's, well, is it, you know, what, what if it's four meters? You've got markings for one meter and two meters. What if it's four? Is that, is that, is that four meters? Is, is that four meters? Is that, I mean, it's. You know, it's, it is what it is. Um, it works well enough, uh, but um, it's, um, you know, auto correcting parallax, auto parallax correcting frame lines in the viewfinder is a nice, nice touch. Um, I think the, the Canon wins that one. Um, lens compatibility. So let's talk about lens compatibility. There are lens compatibility issues between Soviet and Japanese um, in 39 rangefinders. The, the, um, although they don't become a practical problem uh, until, well, the focus compatibility doesn't become a practical problem until you get past 50 millimeters into like, you know, your 85 millimeter portrait length. Um, uh, although there are other issues, for example, and this is a point of some, some contention amongst Canon P users. Because lenses for um, rangefinder lenses are not cheap. This is a Soviet Jupiter 12. It is a 35 millimeter f2.8 lens. It's it is a copy of the Zeiss Biagon, I think, either Biagon or Biatar. I think Biagon. Anyway, by something. So it's a copy of the Zeiss formula, uh, and it's a really nice lens. And it's they're very popular, and they're not that expensive. Uh, I think you, you can get a nice one for you know, hundred dollars, hundred fifty dollars U.S. Um, and the problem is, well, for, for if you've got a Canon P, the, the problem is this rear element right here is huge. Now, there are some Canon P owners who will fearlessly shoehorn their Jupiter 12 into the P. The problem is the Canon P has these things called light baffles, which are, it's, it's an in, they're internal parts which can, can scratch up against this rear element. Um, and the general advice that used to be given on all the collector forums 10, 20 years ago was, you know, do not under any circumstances put a Jupiter 12 into a Canon P or into a Canon rangefinder in general. Well, into a Canon five or six series rangefinder because of the light baffles. Um, it, will, it will scratch the rear element and you could damage the camera and you could damage your lens, so just don't do it. Well, nowadays you got a lot of uh, the younger collectors saying, oh, it's not a problem, you know, you, it's, it's, it's tight, but it'll fit. And you, know, you, just have to, you just have to be really careful when you thread it and uh, you know, most of them will fit. I'm like, call me old fashioned, um, I, but I've never once attempted to mount this lens in this camera and I have no plans to try that anytime soon. I just, it's, 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 it's um, I, I caution against it, but, but there are those who disagree. There are those who tell me that I'm being unnecessarily timid. Um, but I, I just, I, I choose to be rather conservative in giving advice on um, handling equipment that I care about. So that's just me. Um, there are also, uh, some people claim that the black body Jupiter 12s will fit in the, into the Canon P, whereas the, you know, the, the white finish or, uh, or that the polished aluminum finish will not, I, I, you know, I don't know. I've, I've never owned a, a black body Jupiter 12. Um, but I'm, I'm, that, that's, that's a, it's something to be concerned about. It, it is a compatibility issue. That's for sure. Um, likewise, you've got compa uh, compatibility issue with anything that retracts. Here's a fed. 
two, and it's it's standard lens, the um, um, the 50 millimeter f uh, 3.5, and here it is fully deployed, and then retract it into the body, like so. Um, again, the, the 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 common wisdom is do not put a retracting lens on your Canon rangefinder, at least not the five and six series. The Barnack style bottom loaders I think can handle it. Um, but the, um, the 5 and 6 series, of which the Canon P is, is, uh, is derived from the 6 series, um, do not. Um, there are some, now I, 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 said, I mentioned that in a prior video, and somebody said, oh, well, one thing you can do if you want to use your you know, Elmar style 50mm um, you know, is deploy it like so, and then just with like wrap rubber bands or tape around the, the lens barrel to prevent it from collapsing back in. Um, I guess you could do that. I, I, you know, my, I, I can't think of a reason why that wouldn't work. But, um, but generally, collapsible lenses are a no-no for uh, this series of camera. Um, and finally, we come to the issue of portrait lenses. So here are two reasonably affordable portrait lenses for your M39 collection. We've got the Canon Serenar. This is well. This one says Serenar. Serenar was a an early brand name used by Canon for its lenses, which it abandoned at some point in the mid 1950s. Um, and here is a Jupiter 9. Uh, these are both 85 millimeter f2 lenses. Uh, they do not share a common optical formula. Um, I, I want to say this is a sonar based formula. This is a Gauss based formula, but I'm not certain about that. If you know, leave a note. Um, I've always kind of wondered that. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but they're both really, they're really nice lenses. I, I, I love the results I've, I've um, achieved with both of these lenses. Um, but one, once you get into portrait length, focal lengths, you, you, you're going to encounter focus compatibility issues. And I know this for a fact because I shot this lens on this camera and I shot about a half roll of film from maybe two to three meters away, uh, you know, taking a headshot of a model, and I focused on her eyes and got her shoulder. So I would say it was about five centimeters off. Uh, and I was shooting this lens wide open at f2, and I was and the, fo the focus um, uh, discrepancy was I would say roughly five centimeters. Um, and uh, it's I mean it's just, it's just not possible that I missed every single shot. I mean I, I must have taken you know a good half half roll of film uh, in that in that position with, with this lens um, and there, there's just no way that I missed focus every single time there's no way and every single one every image came back you know with with her you know her hair or, or her or her hair on her shoulder or her shoulder in, in perfect focus and her eyes blurry so um, there is the, the focus compatibility issue is definitely an issue once you get to the uh, portrait focal length at wider focal lengths um, I, I don't think it is um, I, I, I don't. I don't believe so. In fact, I've used. I don't have it out. I can't show you. But my. Um, I've used the um, the Instar um, 61 LD on the Canon P without problems. I've used a Jupiter 8. Here's a Jupiter 8. This is a standard lens for the Zorky 4. Um, I've got. <laughs> I own three of them. I just love the Jupiter 8. I think it's a great lens. Um, and I've used the Jupiter 8 um, on the on on my Canon P um, and my Canon um, 5L. Um, um, many many times and uh, with, with no problem so uh, so th there is interoperability between these two systems um, with some exceptions and, uh, and I've just gone over some of the major exceptions um, so which one should you buy um, I don't know it's kind of up to you uh, the you know this it's uh, there's pluses and minuses all in all I'd say the better camera is the Canon, um, I think. Um, I think it's probably better built. I think it's probably more reliable. Um, I suspect, I mean, I think, well, the quality control, come on, there, there's no question. The quality control in the Canon factory, in the Canon factory was far superior to the quality control of, of your Zorky 4. But then again, if your Zorky 4 has been you know, overhauled by a competent technician, I mean, the design is adequate. The, the design is solid. You know, the problem with the Soviet cameras is not the design. It's the execution. It's it's the assembly process in the factory. The the basic design was was sound. So you know if, if it's been overhauled by a good tech, you know is the Zorky really any less reliable than the Canon at that point? I don't know. I'm not sure. 
Um, so those are just some of my thoughts. I'm not going to endorse one over the other. I think they're both fine cameras, um, and I, I do enjoy both of them. Um, well, I'll sh say a word about the shutter speed dial. Nothing. Um, and this is, I think this is a, an over 40 issue. <laughs> um, this shutter speed dial is really easy. And the, again, this is like 1970s SLR style shutter speed dial. It just turns, uh, it's clearly marked, clearly spaced. There's, there's your index mark right there. Um, whereas on the, um, on the Zorky, you have to, um, there's, a, there's your index mark there. It's a thin little dark line right there. Um, and you have to lift and twist and um, uh, the markings are next to the shutter speed is a tiny little black dot uh, and it's it's really easy to miss I mean uh, again it, it, when I when I have to change shutter speeds oftentimes I'll have to like take off my glasses and, and, and put this thing like a you know a few inches from my face in order to make sure that I've got the right shutter speed set um, so yeah that's a little it's that's a little it's kind of an over 40 issue you know if you have young strong eyes you can you can handle it a little bit better than um, than those of us who who don't um, um, what else can I say about the camera rangefinder patches so the rangefinder patch on a, on, a, on a rangefinder is kind of important it's important to have a bright clear contrasty rangefinder patch and I will say that the patches on both of these cameras are faded um, the, I don't think it's the case that one necessarily lasts or better than the other or or, or one has uh, as a group held up better than the other i think that depends on uh, how well the camera was was stored or under what conditions the camera was stored uh, the rangefinder patch on the p is certainly usable but it is not as contrasty as it was with the day it left the factory there's no question in my mind about that likewise on the zorky 4 uh, similar situation. So yeah, the rangefinder patches on these old cameras they, they will fade. Um, although you know they, they they remain usable up to a point. Um, and and again, I think it's a uh, <laughs> some of that's just just an over forty issue. What what I call an over forty issue. If you have young strong eyes, um, you can deal with that a little bit better than than those of us who are <laughs> past our optical prime um, in in that in that way. Okay, so um, those are some of my thoughts uh, about uh, these two cameras, pluses and minuses of each. And, um, you know, make up your own mind. If you have information which you feel is helpful, uh, please do leave a comment and um, uh, be a part of the conversation. Thank you so much. I hope you found this video amusing, informative, or a combination thereof. And uh, if so, please do like and subscribe. And as always, check out the links down below. Thanks now. Bye-bye.